Ken, as a tenured professor in your mid-40s, what made you think that you could change careers? Well, this is America, and you can do whatever you want to do. It's one of the great things about this country. And uh, I was, uh, what I was doing was very related to the career I'm in now. It was developing stories, developing writers, and of course, teaching a number of things that I no longer teach, like classical literature and Italian literature. Uh, and I do miss I do do miss that part, but it was basically an extension of what I've been doing all of my life, which is developing stories, analyzing stories, publishing stories, helping people publish stories, um, and now getting stories produced into movies. So it's all united by storytelling. Uh, I had no idea which world was sort of the big, bigger world of ideas, the world of academia that I'd been in for 17 years or the world I went into. And I discovered that the world I went into was really the world of ideas because it's a world in which people are tracking ideas across continents to find out who owns the rights to a story. They're, you know, they, they pay lots of money to acquire the story, at least they used to pay lots of money. Uh, and they spend millions of dollars to turn the story into a movie. Um, and they're fiercely competitive about the world of ideas. It's, it, the motion picture business is the jungle of ideas and uh, it's survival of the, the best idea and the best business people. I always say it's, it's called show business for a reason. It's not just about show, it's about the business of how stories get developed into movies that the whole world can see. I'm hoping we can go back to maybe right before you made this transition into wanting to be in film. Um, was there something that happened? Was there just a time in your life, in your mid-40s, where you just felt like, you know what, I, I want a new challenge? You know, that's a good question because it's, <clears throat> I, it, I've reflected on it all my life since then. And it was actually provoked by my receiving tenure. Uh, I actually belong to a untenured faculty committee against tenure uh, and one day when I was a Fulbright professor in Bologna, Italy, I got a telegram from the dean of the faculty at Occidental College telling me that I'd received tenure in my absence and my reaction to it was not very understandable to my friends and colleagues. I, I became deeply depressed for about a year um, and it took me a long time to figure out why I was depressed and it was because I'd really never asked to be in this golden cage where nothing can happen to you. Uh, it was like the most secure place you could be. And I realized at the time that my father's chief value in life was security. He was a child of the depression and security was all important to him. And I, I had to admit to myself that it wasn't that important to me. I never worried about being secure. I published lots of things and I was in demand as a speaker and just never had to worry about it. Um, and what my value was, was freedom. And I didn't feel freedom when in, under a, a structure where you had to behave a certain way and you had to know a year in advance that on the week of October 12th, you'd be teaching book eight of the Iliad. Um, and that it was wonderful to be teaching the Iliad, but to have to to know that a year in advance you're going to be somewhere. I now live in a world where I don't know where I'm going to be tomorrow, literally, and 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 it's complete opposite. It's a world. It's a free world. And of course, I realized as I got older that uh, freedom is as much an illusion as security. Both of them are illusions, but it was my illusion. Security was not my illusion, and uh, so I've lived with complete insecurity, but with the freedom to express myself creatively in every possible way, which is what the film business uh, allows me to do. And so that was very exciting to me. Do you ever tell people that, that if they're looking to be in a creative pursuit, whether it's being an author or screenwriter or actor, that security is something that will probably not be part of what they'll encounter and to <laughs> yeah. be okay with that. Absolutely. I mean, this is not a career to wish on anyone. You have to have a burning desire to do it. 
and you have to be willing to sacrifice anything to do it and to persist despite every setback. And I can tell you that this is a, a business in which, a career in which this never gets easier. I don't care how many movies you've done, the next one is gonna be the biggest challenge you've ever faced. Uh, the world changes all the time. It's been changing ever since I've been in it, which is around 30 years now. And uh, it never gets any easier and it never gets any more secure. And you know, even if you had windfalls, lots of money, you would put it into your next, you know, your next project because people in this business believe in what they're doing. That's their most important common uh, belief. And you can see it at the Academy Awards. You, you hear the stories as they receive rewards that they never thought they'd get or have been waiting for a lifetime for. Uh, they all have one thing in common, the, the ability to sacrifice uh, what everyone else considers the most important things in order to achieve the dream of getting the story told to the whole world. And that's that's the, the great thing about the career. There's no limits to it. It's infinitely challenging. It's constantly challenging. There are surprises every day. Uh, and it's completely unpredictable. I'm almost thinking of a, a sales position like door to door where you have to just suit up and, and go on your, your in work your farm. And it sounds like right. with this industry, um, it, it's, it's an everyday sort of, you have to be that person sort of drumming up leads and things like that. Yeah, it's a completely self-starting business. Uh, you hear repeatedly from actors and from writers and from everyone that being represented by a agency does not really help because everyone said, I always get my, I've always gotten my best jobs by myself. And I hear that from musicians and from every member of this business that they get their own work. And, and suiting up is every morning is putting on your brain and telling it that it's got to be happy and go out there. And it doesn't matter how bad things are. Uh, in reality, you have to put on a happy face. Uh, and I've gone to many meetings that I absolutely did not feel like going to because something had just happened that was a setback. And I just thought, I want to stay home, lick my wounds, but I go to the meeting and it always turns out that those meetings are the best meetings that you go to. And uh, when you walk out, you think, thank God I went. I mean, what would have happened if I hadn't gone? And that, that is suiting up. That is definitely a kind of a nightly uh, encounter to put on your armor and go out there. And, and you're working with people who are doing the same thing. And that's part of the exhilaration of it is that you know that the person sitting across from you may have had worse things happen to him in the last 24 hours, but he's still there on the job and putting on a happy face and getting it done. Uh, it's, it's very deceptive and seductive. Uh, when people come here for the first time, especially clients of mine, I, I warn them uh, that they will be experiencing what's called the development dance, where everyone will be extremely nice to them and extremely positive, and then they'll never hear from them again. And that's because people are doing their job. And their, their job is to uh, m find out what this person has to offer the world. And if it's extremely exciting, which is rare, very rare, uh, then you'll hear from them. But most of the time it's not extremely exciting and, and exciting enough or, or, and or it doesn't fit the agenda of, the, of this person's company at the moment, they have something too much like it in development, or they have a boss who does not want to do that particular kind of thing, et cetera. Uh, but their job is to be the best audience possible for any story that comes along that could be a dramatic story that people would, you know, would, that would attract audiences. And so they'll, they'll be happy in the, in the meeting, and then at the end of the meeting, you know, behind the back of the person who came to the meeting, they'll make a decision about whether to pursue it or not. And that's what you're up against. So you are like a door-to-door -door salesman. I always say there's a great blackboard in the sky that has every no you'll ever receive in your life written on it. And finally a yes at the end of the no's. And the only catch is you can't see it. 
So what do you do? You, you go through the news as fast as you can. That's the only way to deal with that blackboard. And uh, that's what successful people do in the business. They just keep getting those no's until somebody says yes. What key steps did you take to go from being a tenured professor, most people would do many things that probably aren't good to be in those shoes, to a movie producer? What I'm sure, first of all, you had to deal with social pressure, people probably trying to talk you out of it, maybe not. But what steps did you take? Um, well, in retrospect, you can always make it look more you know, planned and logical than, than it was at the time, but I basically, I ran into a very inspiring man whose name was Norman Cousins, who was the editor of Saturday Review World in those days. And uh, he came to speak in a class of mine at Occidental College. And it turned out we shared uh, a motto that no one else in the world had ever heard of. And the motto was a, was a single sentence by the philosoph Spanish philosopher Ortega y Gasset that said, I think the only immoral thing is for a being not to use every instant of its existence with the utmost intensity. And uh, I had never heard anyone else quote that, but after, our, after his talk in my class, I asked him to come to my office and showed him that it was framed above my desk. And so needless to say, we bonded and long story short, I asked him you know, what I should do when I grow up, which I asked male authority figures all my life, basically. And he, he told me after we got to know each other that I should consider the entertainment business because it was much broader than the academic world and uh, people could basically do whatever, you know, anything creative you're encouraged to do, basically. And you could find your own way. Uh, there are no rules and schedules and all of those kinds of things that we find in academia. And I love academic, you know, the world and the, the ideas that are exchanged and all of that. But it was restricting, and it was, you know, for me, suffocating, which is a word that um, is, means a lot to me personally. It's my mo most ancient nightmare is being suffocated. And I've never been suffocated in, you know, in the entertainment world. I've been terrified a lot, but not suffocated. And uh, so he encouraged me, and I thought, well, I don't know anything about the entertainment world other than movies that I've seen, that's it. And he showed me a passage from a book by William Goldman that I hope everyone knows called Adventures in the Screen Trade. And the passage was uh, that the only important rule in Hollywood is that nobody knows anything. And I thought, well, that's, that's good. It means it's a level playing field. So I set out to learn as much as I could. And I realized that I wasn't 18 years old in the mail room at William Morris. And I wasn't, you know, infinitely wealthy, and I didn't have relatives in the film business. Those are like the three main ways to get into the business normally. So I thought I, I just have to be smarter. So I started writing, uh, reading contracts. I remember a producer, uh, I'll never forget. I asked him if I could read a distribution contract, and he said, "Yeah, I can let you read it, but I can't let you take it out of my office. You can go out in the other room and have a cappuccino and." But, you know, do that. So I read it and I, I came back an hour later and I said, uh, I'm confused about some things I read here. Can I ask you a couple of questions? And he said, sure. And he, I said, this paragraph number 48 in the fine print section at the end says that accounting terms used in this agreement shall be redefined by the 20th Century Fox accounting department at such time, if any, that litigation is entered into among the parties. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, that is not in there. I go, yes, it is. Let me show you. I showed it to him. And he said, I can't believe that that's still in there. My, my attorney should have crossed that out. He had just signed the agreement. And I said, well, they didn't. So I, I started learning. That's how I started learning by reading contracts, because I think whatever kind of thing you're trying to do uh, if it's successful, ends up with being a bunch of contracts. So you might as well start backwards with the contracts. And long story short, while I was preparing myself that way over a six-month period, I, I came up with an idea that I sold 
basically on a wing and a prayer, not knowing how to do it. But it ended up being, within the next 12 months, 16 movies uh, that I was completely in charge of and raised half the money from Warner Brothers and half the money from, um, from a company in Canada, went up to Montreal and shot them all back to back, meaning one movie ended on Friday and the next one began on Monday. And uh, it was a series of romantic comedies. And it came out of my teaching romantic literature and also teaching publishing because a, a publisher was talking in, one of, in my publishing class a visiting publisher was talking to my class and he was telling me, he was telling us what goes on the cover of a romance novel. And I realized as he listed the things that were on the cover that he was basically reciting the rules of courtly love that I was teaching in another class that were written in the 12th century by Andreas Capellanus, the, the chaplain of, of Marie de France. And, uh, and I thought, so maybe romance novels that everyone makes fun of are just an extension of these ancient courtly stories, these love stories. And uh, I, I came up with the idea of doing a series of movies that imitated these love stories and were marketing uh, friendly because they all had colors. So you could have put all the DVDs on the, you know, on the shelf and they would form a, a rainbow. So they were all called things like The Rose Cafe, Sunset Court, Indigo Autumn, etc. And we did 16 of them. And by that time I was, I was fully in the, in the business because I was in charge of production uh, as a creative production. And uh, within three movies, my assistant and I were, you know, we knew what we were doing, whereas we did not have any idea what we were doing before the first movie started shooting. And then I came back to Los Angeles and became a literary manager because I didn't have resources to option properties. But as a literary manager, you can produce properties by managing the property. And that's what uh, got me going And uh, ever since then. So it was, that was how the transition occurred. And it was just because I thought of an idea and I didn't know better if I known now what you know what if I'd known then what I know now, I would never have sold it the way I sold it. I, I simply went out with the concept and convinced several studios to look at it seriously and none of them had looked at a script or anything like that and one of them, Warner Brothers, wanted to see a script and I wouldn't show it to them uh, until they'd signed an agreement. And they ended up signing an agreement in three days and then I showed them, I, I manufactured the scripts over the weekend by putting out a call to the romance novel community and getting back, you know, ideas for the script and so on. So it, it was a fluke. And one of the hardest things about being in the business when you've been in it for a while is the, there grows up this huge accumulation of experience that you have that makes you know that you shouldn't just pick up the phone and call the head of a studio. And, and I have to overcome that. I just reached out to the head of a studio this morning. But every time I do it, it's like having a 500 pound weight in your hand to pick up the phone because you know that's wrong. But somebody like me back then, I didn't know it was wrong. So I, you know, it was light, it was a light motion to pick up the phone and call, call somebody. And uh, so whenever I get a new partner who's not involved, I always say, don't be afraid to tell me your craziest ideas because this is a world in which crazy ideas work. And uh, you know, it's, it's the traditional ideas that have a harder time working. So it, it is a completely wild and entrepreneurial frontier. Uh, it's probably the last frontier of American culture, the, the movie business, and uh, it's been changing ever since I've been in it. It constantly changes from a world in which video cassettes dominated and you could find them everywhere and to a world in which we're downstreaming from Netflix and Hulu and so on. And the, the delivery methods have always changed. And what doesn't change, and this is the encouraging thing for writers, is that the need for stories has only gotten greater and greater with the proliferation of hundreds of channels. They all have one thing in common, they need programming, they need content. And uh, writers are 
the ones who create the content, the intellectual property. So they should be hugely encouraged. You don't have to understand all the distribution methods. You just need to know how to tell a story and, and you're in good shape. Just keep telling stories. How did you learn to tell a great story? You know, I learned how to tell stories on the porch in Louisiana when I was growing up because I had, uh, I was grown up in the country and born on a farm and my uncles were all, uh, you know, farmers and storytellers. And uh, we sat on the front porch and told stories. And every conversation started as a conversation but quickly went into a story. E even a trip to town was a story. Everything was a story. And I noticed, of course, quickly that some people could tell them and some people couldn't. I mean, a lot of stories down there were jokes. Uh, and, you know, one uncle I had, the minute he started talking, everybody seemed to leave the porch because he was the dullest storyteller I have ever run into in my life. You know, I loved him dearly, loved to go fishing with him, but don't let him get tell, telling the story uh, because it takes him forever to tell it. And at the end, you can't even remember how it began. But the other uncle was mesmerizing and you loved listening to his stories. And when he started telling stories, people started showing up on the porch and I think that's really where I learned, where I realized that this was a basic form of human communication that uh, I wasn't getting in Kansas City, which was much more businesslike and conversation was for the sake of getting to the next point in the day. And down there, it was a, it was a focus in itself. You know, everyone looked forward to getting up at 4.30 and sitting on the porch for an hour telling stories before the day began. And, and, and then reassembling at seven and telling stories until everyone conked out at the end of the day. So that's definitely where I got the start uh, in loving the power of stories. I mean, I, I think that uh, those stories changed everyone's lives and you never forget a story. I mean, you can, you can forget your, your mathematical equation and you can forget you know, your chemistry, but you just don't forget a good story. And, and that's made me fall in love with it from the very beginning. And I, you know, I've been very lucky because I spent my whole life dealing with stories. That's all I deal with every day. What three things does a great story have to have? What th three things? Hmm. Uh, well, it has to be, it has to have a hook that gets people instantly involved in the story. And, and that, is a huge part of the story itself. And it's, it's got to have a very strong character in the story that you care about. And other than that, it has to have twists and turns that lead to a surprise ending. And I, if I had to just say three things, I guess that's what I would say the three things are. Every, every story needs that because a, a story about nothing is not going to hold anyone's interest. And, and sometimes writers, when they begin their careers, think that they just, if they just write, they can write about anything. But the truth is they need to write from their heart about ma things that matter to everyone. Uh, and if they do that, you can hardly go wrong. Because stories are really not about words or word choice or anything like that. They're about conveying the power of, of a character facing a dilemma that you have no idea how he or she will will resolve. And uh, when you do that, you've got everyone's attention. And when, in, in ancient times, they, there was a thing called the oral tradition, which I used to teach as a professor of Homeric Greek. Uh, the, the Iliad and the Odyssey were sung, you know, at campfires, and everyone in the culture knew the stories. Uh, it's, we're publishing a book right now on Homeric song and how it worked and how it held culture together. And my first book was about those, I call those stories, the shield of memory. That it was because of those stories that a person knew how to deal with himself in battle or when facing a, an attacking boar or when facing an angry wife, you know, or when facing a pillagers trying to burn down his village. They, he would instantly think of the story of Heracles who did this and that, or the story of, you know, Aegean who did this and that. And that's all they had. They didn't have books, you know, for learning 
it was all passed along through the oral tradition. And I think stories have never failed to play that role in human life. When you think about it, you know, what's your story is probably the most human response to any encounter. And it goes from a court of law where the jury is trying to decide which of the two stories do they believe to a political campaign where the voters are making that decision to a first date where you're going, do I believe his story? I just don't believe it. I can't buy his story. That's, that's the, the ultimate human turndown. You can't buy the story. And it, it goes through everything. Advertising is conveying stories that people will, you know, so that people will want to buy the product. Uh, this is how humans operate on a daily basis. So to me, it's absolutely amazing that an industry has been created where people will pay millions of dollars for stories uh, and where stories can basically conquer the world and I believe unite the world. I mean, look at all the work we're now doing with China in the movie business. Uh, I just saw uh, Lara Croft to Tomb Raider, the new version of it, where the male lead is Chinese and she is Western. And clearly as a producer, I'm watching it going, this was a Chinese financed movie because I understand how it works for the market. You know, the Chinese hero makes it perfect for the Chinese market and he looks pretty good, but she's the real, the real protagonist in the story and she's great for the Western market and she's a woman, so it's all very contemporary and et cetera. So you see the structure behind it is actually a cultural change because now the values of the West are being inserted in the Chinese market with the Chinese co-op cooperating with them. Uh, and, and as I believe, China is becoming more capitalistic all the time, uh, partly through the influence of movies. The audience wants to see individual people doing what they want to do in life and going out there and kicking ass and not being under the thumb of some, you know, emperor or despot. So I think that this is why the whole storytelling thing is so exciting because it really is a universal experience. The question is, what stands in most people's way of achieving their dreams? So it sounds oh. simple, we can achieve dreams and yeah. there's a million books on it, but what do you think is actually the block for many people? Um, I, you know, I have written a book called Quit Your Day Job and Lead the Life of Your Dreams based on my own experience and that of others. Uh, one of my favorite stories, I was on Joyce Brothers television show years ago with a couple of other people and one of them was a, a man in his, he was then in his 80s and just had received his law degree from the University of Chicago. And uh, he, he told, he told uh, her that he was standing in line for registration four years earlier and one of the young people in line behind him said, sir, um, are you sure you're in the right line? And he said, and I turned around and I said, what line should I be in? And I thought, that is America. That's the essence of America. You, you are in whatever line you want to be in in this country. And uh, he fearlessly walked up and stood in the line and got a, his law degree at the age of 86 or whatever he was. And to me, it, it, what stands in people's way is fear. And, and their, their friends inflicted on them. So one of the chapters in my book has to do with distinguishing between friends and friendly associates. Because when I left the academic world, uh, I had a few friends and I had lots of friendly associates. I learned the difference when I decided to leave because I retained a few friends, but most everybody I did not retain as friends because they thought I was absolutely crazy. They either thought that uh, in a kind of benign way or they just thought I was, I mean, they, or they just were extremely angry that I was leaving a tenured position. They, they thought that was completely ungrateful and crazy. And I could also see that they were fearful about it. And, and I knew well, I knew them well enough to know that many of them were envious, wish they could do it, but just wouldn't do it because they're set in their ways. And one of, that's one of the reasons I didn't like tenure because it, once you had tenure, you didn't have to publish anymore. You didn't have to do anything anymore. Uh, and of course, if you're truly motivated, that's not going to stop you. And there were a few people who were unstoppable, but mostly they weren't. 
unstoppable and they just stopped. And to me, that was a crime because I didn't understand anything other than the merit system as, you know, something that should rule an academy of ideas, you know? So I, I think what makes people afraid is the fear of being out on the street. You know, it's an image that, that I've had, you know, in the first 10 years of getting into a new world where I realized I wasn't going to get a check every two weeks regularly. You know, you, you have that image if you were raised by depression era parents. And, and you also have the other image of the wolves at the door. Uh, I remember that one because I, I, I found a quick way around it. Go to the door, open the door, and if you don't see any wolves at the door, then there are no wolves at the door. Uh, but it is, it is an image that pops into your mind in the middle of the night, as, as does the homeless image and many other things. But if you're afraid of images, then you shouldn't be in the world of images. I mean, that's what I do is I create images and develop images and turn them into movies. So how can I let you know, images that are in my brain control my actions? Uh, you have to learn to overcome that. And uh, so I, I think people have to clearly understand themselves and, and decide on who to listen to. You know, if you truly are a friend and you love somebody, you encourage them to fulfill their dreams. Uh, and I always did that to my students. I always felt like you have a dream and you're afraid of accomplishing it. What if your dream is the most important dream that ever came along in the human race and you don't do anything about it? It was your dream and you do nothing about it. To me, that's a sacrilege. You know, you, you had the dream for a reason. You know, it, it's in your mind for a reason. Either God put it there or it, it was born in your mind from some other source. Why aren't you going to do something about it? Well, because I'm afraid that my father and mother would be really upset. And I go, so this is a hypothetical fear about something that hasn't happened yet, right? Yes. Then why not just do it and deal with the possibility that may never happen at all? And uh, that's, it, it's a matter of knowing yourself. I mean, that's one of the things I talk about first in the book. I was raised on Greek philosophy and what it said over the Oracle of Delphi was know thyself. That that's, was the most important piece of knowledge that Plato and Aristotle and Socrates taught. And uh, knowing yourself means you know you're going to be haunted by this dream if you don't do it. I mean, I've had a partner who said once when her movie was in trouble, uh, maybe this is one of those dreams that should never have happened. And I go, that is complete blasphemy. You know, you say that now, but later you will see that that was, uh, that, that was some other voice talking to you other than your own voice. Because you, you made this thing happen and, you know, you will be proud of that as she was. And that's, I think, the simply fear is the number one impediment to people going for their dreams. And it's fear, you know, everyone knows the acronyms about fear. It's fear is about things that haven't happened yet, that may never happen, uh, just like worry. And we all do it. We all have fears. We all have worries. But overcoming your fears is what, you know, valiant people do. It's what, you know, people that you would like to be like do. So why not do it yourself uh, and, and not have to live with the regret, which is the big monster equal to fear that you live with if you are sitting on that proverbial front porch in your rocking chair thinking about the dreams that you had and didn't do. I mean, to me, that's a terrible waste of life to have that happen. Also, stripping away illusions, and you talk about knowing thyself and being comfortable enough to know that if you have to stand by yourself for a while because you've lost the illusion of some of the friendships or peer group that you thought was going to be there with you, if for whatever reason socially they've gone the other way, knowing that that's okay as well. Yeah, I mean, th that's a very good point because I think as you get older, you realize that uh, you cannot govern your life by what other people think. And it's, you know, I live on the 11th floor and I look out over the millions of lights in, in Los Angeles. And it's a great comfort to think that there are, you know, a few lights out there that love me. You know, there are maybe fewer that hate me. and But there are millions that have no idea that I exist. That's 
comfortable and it's sort of the cosmic view of life when you think about it you're you're just one little tiny piece of a massive co cosmos that is going about its massive me mechanism with on its own without any need for you to consult with it and uh, for you to be worried about what you know some other person somewhere else thinks about you is a complete waste of your energy in every way your job is to do what your dreams tell you to do and uh, to do it with all your might the way the cosmos does and what other people are saying and thinking and doing first of all because most of them are not spending any time thinking about you at all could care less what you do or don't do most of them are thinking only about themselves so that's a natural condition and why should you be any different you know if you have a dream just do it and if you're the, the crazy painter that has been turning out paintings in the garage down the street and everyone thinks you're a crackpot but then they learn that you sold one of your paintings for a million dollars and now it's going to be in the Louvre you know suddenly they go I always knew that that gal was a genius you know she she really had talent from the very beginning people change instantly which shows how much value their opinion really has right and uh, that's why I just think it's you, you've got to really listen to yourself and, and not listen to everybody else and the few people you can tell your friends because the ones that support you in doing that are your true friends <clears throat> and if the person who's not supporting you is I've had several clients in my career who whose spouses did not support them and uh, you know my advice is divorce your spouse I'm sorry you know like I take this seriously I take <coughs> this is a profession this is a vocation and if you know someone close to you is telling you don't do it it's selfish um, you need to get somebody else close to you you know who will encourage you because all the all the monumental great things in life I think are done by people who go for it and who are not afraid of taking a chance and who are therefore supported by a few true friends you know or loved ones who tell them to do it you know it's uh, many examples from my own life but uh, when I decided to leave the tenured position my daughter was a junior at Columbia and one thing that would be jeopardized would be her senior year at Columbia and I brought her up to Montreal where I was shooting movies and we had a long talk about it you know offset and uh, she said dad you absolutely have to do this you, you have to do it don't worry about that and of course that problem got solved and didn't end up being a problem but it was a concern but she had no concern for it and um, that's how I know you know who my true friends are and that's how you would know too if you decide you want to do something listen carefully to what the people around you say because when people are telling you no they're expressing their own fears and some of it may be good-hearted they're, they're afraid that the things they fear may happen to you but if you're willing to take the risk you know don't let them influence you because they're not taking the risk you know unless they depend on you and then you have to figure that out and I, and I did certain things when I left that career to make sure that those who depended on me would not you know end up being left without resources so I did what I had to do to make sure that happened and then once I did that I my my conscience was clear and I was able to embrace it fully with all the risks that it entailed and I you know no regrets even though there were some very dark times uh, and, and there are always ups and downs in, in, in a business like this one and in a career that is uh, bereft of security you know the, the other side of that coin is that as much as security is an illusion rejection is also an illusion because you, you can take as many chances as you want you know I constantly hear people tell me even on the phone this morning you only get one shot that was a distributor telling me we only get one shot and I thought well okay maybe that's true for you but I get as many shots as I want to take and Hollywood is you know first of all doesn't exist what is Hollywood right it's just a concept but in reality the business that I'm in all you have to do is tell somebody I've got a great new story and they are all ears immediately they don't care that it's been 10 years since you talked to them you know you, you spend a few seconds in chit chat and then they want to hear the story 
So you can take as many, you know, as many chances as you want to take unless your own psychology disallows that because it wants you to get depressed and, you know, spend, go into a coma of, of unhappiness and uh, take rejection seriously, etc. I just don't have time. You know, one of my essays is called The Waiting Room and it's about what you do while you're waiting for an answer on a creative project. Well, you don't wait, you do something else. You know, you, you make another creative project, you get it going. And by the, you know, if you keep doing that, every project has its own clock. You can't do much to control that clock, but you can be doing another project. And sooner or later, you have projects all around you that are in various states of, of, of ripeness, and they will happen in their own time. And your biggest problem will be, what if two of them happen at the same time? And I always say, don't worry about that. I mean, that's the kind of problem you wanna have. You, you don't wanna have the problem of nothing happening. So no, you don't wait at all. And I think a lot of writers torture themselves because they wait. You know, they, they send off a manuscript hypothetically into the snail mail. No one does that anymore, but they send it off and then they wait for an answer. Why would they wait for an answer? That's a complete waste of time. Instead, you instantly work on something else. And that way, when something comes from the first thing, you're, you're surprised and you're, you deal with it immediately without wasting any kind of psychological energy on it. You just, if it's a rejection, you take take it and you move on. And if it's, a, if it's somebody offering you a deal, then you consider the deal. But you don't, writers feel like they have to spend an additional 90% of their time fretting over it all, analyzing it, you know, soul searching over it. And you do that when you're younger and it's fine to do some of it because you may get a lot of creativity out of it. But once you've gone through it and tortured yourself, you know, to your own satisfaction, you don't have to do that all the time. You can just go back to work. And Ray Bradbury used to say that to writers, get back to work, it'll get rid of all these moods you're having. You know, and I always thought that's the most brilliant advice. Work is the solution. What do you wish someone had sat you down and said to you in the beginning of embarking on the entertainment side of your career? Uh, <laughs> don't waste your time. I, I wish somebody had told me, don't waste your time, because I've wasted some time in my life, believe it or not, despite you know what I've said about not wasting time and not waiting. and. Um, I think that's maybe the only advice that I would have liked to hear. Uh, but, you know, they also try to put you in a niche. Like I was constantly told, find your niche, find your niche. And uh, I, I founded a magazine once called DreamWorks and it was about the, the relationship between dreams and the arts. And it was an interdisciplinary journal with Ursula Le Guin and Joyce Carol Oates and John Foles and Carlos Fuentes on the advisory board and many others. I mean, 20 people of equal stature. And it covered all the arts. And I was told by one publisher, it was too general, you need to find a niche. And, but another publisher accepted it and published it for 10 years. And uh, so <laughs> listening to the advice of Telling someone telling you to find a niche. Uh, so the reason I'm fumbling about the answer to your question is I really never had that that issue in my life of what it, what I wish someone had told me. I kept finding people that I respected who told me the exact right thing that I needed to hear. And, and one person around this whole issue said, what's remarkable about you is your diversity Never give up your diversity, no matter what. And that piece of advice was the most uh, wholesome piece of advice I could have received. And it was from a person I respected tremendously. So I never really had that question of what would I have liked to hear, because I did hear it. And it meant that I wasn't afraid to go into feature films with, with the major studios, into independent films, or into television. And I, you know, produce movies and, and projects and all those places and categories. 
because I never let anyone stop me from being diverse. And I thought that was, that I needed that piece of advice when I, and I got it. Diversity is something that I've always been in love with because I was, when I was in college, I was an English and classics kind of double major because I couldn't decide, you know, which one to go for. And uh, when I heard about comparative literature uh, my last year at Georgetown, I thought, this is perfect. It's a study of different cultures and it's about putting things together, you know. So I've written crazy pieces like comparing Wallace Stevens to Petrarch and, uh, you know, Dante with Joyce and so on. And that's what I just think is the most interesting thing is when you juxtapose two things or three things rather than focusing on one thing. And that's one of the things the academic world uh, annoyed me about sometimes uh, until I discovered comparative literature and took that degree at Yale and, and then ended up teaching that. And, and I think that the rest of my life has been an extension of do, working in more than one discipline. I mean, in addition to movies, I'm very uh, involved in books. I've just finished another book of my own, and I've, um, I published books because four years ago, I realized that I was having a hard time after publish, after selling books to New York for 20 years or more and having nearly 20 New York Times bestsellers. Uh, I realized that because of all the... Uh, conglomeration that was going on among the publishers pur purchased by large corporations around the world, there was no longer uh, much chance for a young new voice to be published. What they're looking for is established brands. And, you know, the old joke that Stephen King could publish, you know, the phone book with his name on it. And that's, that's just the way it is in this, you know, huge country where marketing and branding is what it's all about to get to the attention of this 300 million audience. So I came up with the idea, and what was happening to me is because I didn't, couldn't publish things as easily as I could before, I published 250 books, I mean sold them to publishers, and I could take those books to Hollywood and sell them to Hollywood. So I no longer had books to take to Hollywood, so I decided to start my own imprint, Story Merchant Books, which I did, and that was, you know, five years ago, and we've published over 200 books now. And I now take them to Hollywood and set, set them up as series or set them up as movies. And uh, no one seems to mind that they're not Random House books. They don't even look at the publisher, basically. They listen to me pitch the story at lunch, and then they take the book home and read it. And uh, so I've always been involved in, you know, it's sort of like comparative situation because I've got New York publishing and Hollywood, and I've use them back and forth against each other. One time, uh, because Hollywood has this huge respect for books, and New York has this awe of movies, primarily because of the marketing money associated with movies that they can then write along with when they republish the book. So I'm hoping to have a big auction coming up soon on a movie that's appearing this summer after 22 years uh, called The Meg from Warner Brothers. And it, it, we sold it 22 years ago. That's how long it's been. We developed it through one of my companies and then sold it to a publisher and then we sold it to a studio. And it's been 22 years in development hell until finally it's, it's getting made. And, and one of the good things about stories is that they're timeless. One of my favorite examples, of, which was no solace to its author, Mel, Herman Melville, is that Moby Dick sold about 60 copies prior to Melville's death. And within two decades after his death, it became not only an international bestseller, but the great American novel. Uh, so the stories are timeless, and that's what writers are, are capable of doing, of creating something timeless, which is of immense value, obviously, to the human race. The Iliad and the Odyssey were composed thousands of years ago, and yet they're still on every bookstore's shelves. You can find them all over the internet, and uh, so the power of stories, I've always loved the fact that they were, a story grows up to be, can be a book or it can, same story can grow up and be a movie. We once had a screenplay uh, that I loved that won the Nichols Award, one of the highest, you know, uh, 
awards in the business, and it uh, it was placed almost at the top, not quite at the top. But I, I read it, loved it, tried to sell it to the studios. They all thought it was too original. They didn't know who the author was, and they, they ended up passing. So I told the author, let's turn this story into a book. And so, long story short, we did. And I sold it to a major publisher. And within a couple of weeks of selling to a major publisher, we had an auction in Hollywood and sold it to a major studio. Uh, and it went into development. And we've done it kind of the opposite way is somebody was starting to write a project in one form and I told him to write it in the other because of the random conversation I had with a with an editor and she thought it was, sounded like the best novel she'd ever heard and he wasn't a novelist but long story short within three months he wrote a novel and we sold it and then sold it for 1.2 million dollars to you know a major studio in Hollywood so I thought, you know, that's my comparative literature background, that the idea of having two different worlds to put together and recognize how they're you're related to each other. Um, I, I learned that there are wormholes between New York and L.A. Uh, because when I was just beginning to shop the, the novel, in the second case, to New York, I sent it to only one publisher, which is the person that told me it was it sounded like a great idea. She didn't know I only sent it to her, but I sent it to her alone. And three days later, I got a call from George Clooney's partner asking if he could option it. And I, I said, how did you hear about that? And he said, I can't tell you. And I said, well, <laughs> you know, if you can't tell me, um, do you want to read it? I mean, what, what do you want to do? And he goes, no, no, we've read it already and we want, to, we want to make an offer on it. So that began an auction for that property too. But I learned that there was a wormhole going on because I called the editor and fished around talking to her and she denied that anyone had ever read it outside of her office, which isn't, couldn't have been true because clearly someone had read it. It got snuck out through the wormhole so I thought, I, I could only have done this if I had the whole mentality that I will not find my niche and only be working in films. I will not only work in books. I want to work in both. I love them both. And they're just two different forms of storytelling. And why can't any story that's dramatic end up in both camps? And that's kind of what I've done throughout my career is tried to get a story for both camps. It's funny, too, because I would think that the entrance into the literary world, the New York literary world, is much more based on, you know, pedigree and different, you know, whereas Hollywood, you've got a great script, anything goes, you're in the front door if they like it. So it sounds like that's not always the case. That sounds like that's my perception of it. It's not. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, you know, without <coughs> offending you, it's an old-fashioned perception. <laughs> it's okay. It's kind of an all-American old uh -huh. 50s, 1950s yeah, Before I was born, yeah. <laughs> because... You can have a great script and, and get nowhere in Hollywood. Uh, it's getting it to the right person that, that matters. And uh, even with the great script, as that one was where I talked the guy into writing the book uh, and then sold it to, you know, in an auction too, he, he had a great script and, and, and he was able to get it to people, but they didn't buy it because they were afraid. Because what's happened in the last 20 years is that Hollywood and New York have become corporatized They've all been acquired by international conglomerates. You know, there isn't a single studio that isn't owned by some foreign, you know, accumulation, with the exception of Disney, which, of course, is itself an international conglomerate, right? But Sony owns Columbia, and, you know, Paramount is owned by CBS, Viacom, you know. So because of that, the executives have totally changed from a world in which and the same is true in publishing, from a world in which people with guts and vision made decisions about doing a story, publishing it or greenlighting a movie. Now it's, it's, it's corporate people wearing suits who are very worried for their jobs, you know, whose, I always say their main focus is on their, you know, their, their gold cards and their, their Mercedes. Um, and they don't want to do anything to jeopardize that. Whereas the heads of studios in the old days would just take chances. This is a great story. I, I love it. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this story, and uh, but now they can't. They have to show marketing reports, 
and this is true in New York just as well because Hachette has bought, you know, the Warner books and CVS owns Simon & Schuster and Touchstone and all of those things. Uh, every one of the big companies, Holt Springs owns Macmillan and Thomas Dunn books and Tor books and St. Martin's Press and, you know, Penguin Random House, Doubleday, they're all part of one huge foreign conglomerate, uh, Bertelsmann and so on. So because of that, everyone has to think like corporate employees. They have to provide marketing P&Ls, you know, to the uh, editorial department and the, and the marketing department. And the marketing department has the last say, not the editorial department. You know, if they go, how do you know we're going to sell 100,000 copies of this book? Well, I just have a gut feeling. Well, sorry, your track record doesn't justify your having a gut feeling. So they'll let a really talented, brilliant editor make a couple of decisions like that a year. But if she doesn't prove it out by those books becoming bestsellers, you know, she gets less leash every year. And the same is true in Hollywood. And the studios have gotten even worse because they, they're focused now entirely on brands. And in the last six years or so, they are now doing a fraction of the number of movies they used to do uh, because they'd rather spend $200 million on a brand or th then take a $50 million chance on a great story that has no track record. Uh, that's why Twilight got kicked out of Paramount because it was sitting there, you know, in development hell for several years and Paramount didn't get it and they didn't understand why it was going to be great. Summit came along and, and bought it from Paramount and uh, cashed out on it. And Paramount goes, oh, okay, well, they didn't have any regrets because there's no they there. You know, no one sits around wringing hands. Uh, they're all doing understandable logic and no one lost their job over it. That's the important part. Whereas if you green light a movie and it goes down the tubes, you could lose your job. You know, then you're you're out shopping for a new Mercedes, you know. You're leasing one, yeah. You're, yeah, <laughs> at, at another place. Mm -hmm. So that, that's kind of what's happened to the world. But in the meantime, this, the need for stories continues and uh, storytellers are still hugely in demand. You just have to find a new path each time. That's, that's why I started, you know, the imprint so I could get around that issue. And now I just take new, to New York big brands like something with the word Kennedy on it or the word Dracula, I can sell those still, but I don't, I just, I know I can't sell smaller books. I'll try sometimes because I love the book so much, but it, invariably it comes down to better publish this ourselves. One of your many books, Ken, is Right Time, right? Mm -hmm. And so you say that the world can be divided into two people productive people and non-productive people. And that you say productive people have a love affair with time. So I would love to know what makes someone uh, on the right side of time, whereas what makes someone sort of time is their enemy. Um, well, yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> and put in a very intelligent way that makes it hard to figure out the handle on it because time is, uh, time is this, it, it doesn't really exist. I mean, time, is a human construct. We we created time. Uh, squirrels and you know chipmunks don't have much idea of time. And they know the sun rises and the sun goes down, and they know that it rains, but they don't think the way we do. Where you know, they don't keep track of their birthdays, for example. Like only humans do that, and it's unfortunate because you know you're only as old as you think you are. That's the way a squirrel looks at it, and nobody's arguing with the squirrel about it you know but but humans know better and people some people look at time as the enemy and some people look at it as a friend there, there's an old spanish saying that says there's more time than life which i always thought was a wonderful way of looking at it because it's that's what a productive person would say there is more time than life and uh another spanish or italian saying says that l life is Law is is short, but wide, and and that's another way that productive look at it. Like people say, how could you do as much stuff as you do? Well, because that's what I do. I don't do anything else. And I used to give classes on time management and 
do a lot of studies on it. In fact, right time is filled with time management theories. And one of the things I noticed about people is they had no idea where their time went. And, and they go, I don't know where you get find all the time. And I would say, like, I don't know where you lose it. I mean, we all have the same amount of time. And I go, how much time do we have, by the way? How many hours are in a week? And like two out of 10 people can answer that question right off the top of their heads because they've never really multiplied 24 times seven and realized exactly how many hours there are in a week. And so everyone has the same amount of time. So what I would do in a time management class at UCLA or elsewhere is I would say, let's keep chart your time this, this week. I just want you to make a chart of what you do with your time. And let's come in and uh, talk about it next week when we come back together and they would come back in. And, uh, and that was before I asked them how many hours were in a week. I would wait for the third week to ask that question. And they would, some people would come in with 98 hour weeks and some people would come in with 62 hour weeks. Nobody seemed to agree in general how many hours there were in a week because the hours they gave me didn't add up. They didn't make sense. You know, they'd say, I sleep like six hours a week, but it turned out in the third week of analysis that they're actually, I mean, six hours a day, it would turn out that actually they were sleeping 10 hours a day. They just were telling themselves they slept six hours a day. How much time do you spend talking on the telephone? So most people thought they spent maybe 15 minutes a day when in fact they might, they might be an hour a day that they're spending on that. And watching television, of course, some people were saying that they only spent maybe an hour a day when they were really spending three hours a day. And, but, but a productive person knows exactly how long it takes to do something. Like when I write a screenplay or a book, I, I can tell you how many hours it takes to, to do it. And so I know that I can get it done in a certain amount of time. I mean, Agatha Christie apparently wrote as many as 10 books a year. She had to use four or five pen names because she just kept writing. When you think about it, writing is a function of how fast do you type. You know, because if you have your, I always say in my writing book, including that one, I always say, if you don't, if you make it a rule not to sit down to write before you know what you're going to write, then you'll never waste any time and you'll never have writer's block. So simply don't sit down until you know what you're going to write. Then it's just a matter of how fast can you type. So it's better to be walking along the, the beach thinking about the structure of your story than it is to be wasting a lot of time sitting in front of a computer typing stuff and throwing it away and all that stuff. Just figure it all out in your head. And well, what if I forget it? Well, guess what? If you forget it, that's probably good. You're forgetting forgettable things. You won't forget it when it starts getting really good because then it'll do what Faulkner said, it'll start honk, haunting you and you won't be able to forget it. And then you'll just write it down. William Savoyan was asked once how long it took him to write the human comedy because somebody had told the journalist that it took him three days above drugstore. And he said, no, I, it took me all my life to write it. I, it just took me three days to type it out. And, and that's, so if you're productive, you've already figured out that there are certain things that are completely unproductive, such as sitting in front of a blank screen trying to figure out what to put down next and other ways to do things that make you productive. And productive people don't waste their time. As I said, when it comes to waiting, you don't wait, you just do something else. You, what I call it, rotate from one thing to another so that you still have, you have new energy constantly all day because you're switching activities. And when you switch to a new activity, you have new energy just because of that. But you're also pulling energy from the previous activity that's kind of pulling you back and wanting you to do more on it. But that's good instead of listening to it and going back and doing more on the previous activity, it's better to have that kind of little anxiety going on there because then the next time that activity gets a chance at your time, it'll be ready and it'll be more productive during that time compartment. So I, I think that's the whole difference is between productive and unproductive people have never figured out how to use time. They don't even know how to measure time. And they confuse, they confuse things. I mean, there are two functions in life or two entities that we deal with. One is time and the other is work. And 
one of them is, Im is eternal and, and timeless and endless, and the other one is not. And, but people get it wrong. The one that's timeless and endless and eternal is work, not time, unless you're God, you know. But if you're not God, then guess what? You have a limited amount of time. And the only problem is you don't know what the limit is, but that doesn't matter because you just have to operate anyway. But what's infinite is work because good work produces more work. And so does bad work, right? So no matter what kind of work you're doing, it keeps going. And you cannot manage it, therefore, because it's a, it's a given that you can't manage an infinite thing. But you can manage something that is finite, and that's time. So managing time is what we have to do. And, and let's say if you're writing a book and you know that you type seven pages an hour at least, then you give yourself one hour every day to write your book. Well, at the end of 100 days, you've got, you know, how many pages? 700 pages, right? So it's, it's not complicated to figure it out, but you have to manage the right thing. You're managing your time. Because the work will happen only if you give it time to, to attend to it. And what happens is that people procrastinate because they, they think they're trying to manage the work and they, they don't know that you can't manage the work. Like, I'm going to get this book done if it takes me all summer. And then nothing happens. They don't do it. That, that isn't what you should do. You need to say, I'm going to work from 7 to 8 every morning you know, without fail for X five days a week, it's better than seven days a week because your brain revolts when you make it stop something that it's actually enjoying. So if you make it stop after the fifth day, it's very upset and it spends the whole weekend thinking about the project and it's really raring to go on Monday when you start again. Whereas if you keep it going, it'll get worn out and it'll get bored eventually because that's what brains do. So. It, it, that's so productive. Th there's two kinds of productive people too. You know, the unproductive ones. Let's not talk about. It. I mean, they have their own thing going, and I hope they're enjoying life. But productive people are divided into two kinds, and those are the happy ones and the unhappy ones. The unhappy ones are the ones who've never figured out the psychology of creativity, and so they're constantly surprised by it and upset by it. And that's why you have Virginia Woolf and Hemingway and, and you know, Sylvia Plath offing themselves at the end because they, they, they've never figured it out. They've never figured out that at the end of a project, they're going to get depressed. And they're going to go into this postpartum depression that they may never come out of. But if, if you're on the other side of the thing, the happy, productive person, you figured that out already. So what do you do? Before you end a project, you start another project. And then you can't wait to get into the new project, so you don't mind finishing the first project. So you've eliminated postpartum depression. And that's simply because you figured out how your creative mind works, which is what writer's time you know, is all about. And that's what I mean by, you know, productive, happy productive versus unhappy productive people. You don't have to be miserable and suicidal to be a writer. You can be perfectly happy by knowing your system and not letting it do it to you. This might be an old wives' tale as well or an older version of this. The unhappy writers having more depth in which to write about, more, more in which to pull from, whereas the happy writers are just scratching the surface and it might be too much a movie of the week instead of um, something that pulls at your sort of emotional core and, and you put yourselves in the, the character's shoes. I don't know. Again, is that, does that, can we dispel that then? That you have to be unhappy in that sense? Yeah, you know, th this is a famous dilemma that people have been talking about for my whole lifetime. There was a, a book that came out years and years ago called The Drama of the, uh, Gifted, of the Child. Gifted Child. Alice Miller. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and thank you for reminding <laughs> me of the author. But, but you know, it's a very, very interesting book, and it basically says that uh, writers should fear therapy because it might therapize, you know, take away their their angst from which came all of their, you know, their their, their brilliant ideas, and, and it's just they're simply not true uh, because there's just too many examples of productive writers who 
have plenty of angst. And one of my favorite examples is Stephen King, who published in my magazine, DreamWorks. Uh, we sent out a letter to artists all over the world, including him, and said, could you please tell us uh, whether dreams have any influence you know, on your creativity? And if so, give us an example of a dream and, and, a, and a creative work that came from us, came from it. So Fellini sent us a cartoon that he dreamed in the middle of the night that led to Eight and a Half, his movie Eight and a Half. And we got great stuff from all kinds of people. And Stephen King finally, uh, six months later, after everyone else, sent us a very short letter and he said, this is my constant nightmare. I am sitting alone in an attic, typing away, and a little door on the floor of the attic opens and a hideous face comes out of the door and I start typing as fast as I can because the faster I type, the more the door closes and if I slow down, you know, the face keeps coming out. And then he says, does that count? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's a, an example of what you're talking about because he has plenty of angst going on. He has plenty of terror and fear and dark things in his some of his most brilliant works like The Shawshank Redemption and, you know, uh, The Shining. A and he's not an unhappy writer. Like he's, he knows that he needs to put the time in every day. He, he's figured it out and he's prolific and so on. So there are just too many examples of balanced writers. Let's call them mentally balanced writers. One of my favorite statements from the world of art is Salvador Dali said one time, the difference between myself and a madman is that I am not mad. And I love that because only an artist who knows how close sanity is to insanity knows what that means. You know, like he's, he's one of those madmen who isn't mad, whereas a lot of other bad men are mad. And you know, okay, they kill themselves or they kill somebody else or whatever. Um, so it's, it's all about knowing yourself. I mean, it's all about figuring out how your mind works and proving it and testing it until, you know, before you know it, you look back and you go, my God, I've written, you know, all these books, I have all these things going on, and I don't think I'm crazy. And on the other hand, I don't think I'm sane either. You know, it's, it's like you just figured it out. And so you, it doesn't mean you're not having dark spells. It's just that you you kind of look at your dark spells from the outside instead of from the inside. You know, they, it, it's very common in meditation and yoga to understand that you can either be inside yourself all the time and drive yourself crazy by letting your mind run it, you know, what's going on, or you can like stay above your mind and look down on all these thoughts going by and all this stuff and recognize that you, the one looking is in charge, not all the thoughts. And, and the writer's time has a whole theory about how the creative mind works that way, where there's what I call the managing editor looking at the, the fight going on inside your mind and realizing that this can be controlled if, if you trick the two sides of the mind and force them to work together. Um, that's kind of what it's all about, to become productive and happy at the same time. And it, you know, seems to work for a lot of people. Can any book be made into a movie? <laughs> any book? Any book. No, My, I don't think so. Like an instruction manual? That's been done though. Uh, people have made instruction manuals into movies. But no, not any book. But um, the, the, what makes a movie is, is absolute drama. You have to have drama. Uh, and I'm not talking about a bad movie, I'm talking about a good movie, a movie that people will not, you know, fast forward through or switch channels on or any, So to make a, a worthy movie, a, a book has to have drama. And that means it has to have a very clear three acts, beginning, middle, and end. And what defines the beginning is, is something that hooks the audience into the story so that it will not abandon the story. And an ending is something that makes you leave the theater or turn off your television very satisfied with the way the story ended. 
Uh, whether it's happy or sad isn't the point, but it's satisfying, like the end of Witness, where we realize that the lovers cannot stay together, even though we want them to, because it just wouldn't make any sense. And the way the last shot is, Peter Weir taking a long time to let the car drive down the, the lane away from the farm onto the road, it's such a long shot that it gives you a chance to go through your head and think, oh, come on, slow down, turn around, make a U-turn, or run after him. And none of that happens because your mind is now going, you know what, that wouldn't make any sense. This is sad, but it's got to end, but it still was beautiful. And that's good drama and good movie making. And the middle has got to be something, it's the hardest part for any writer, it's, it's got to be something that keeps you there, meaning filled with twists and turns and reversals and unexpected events and so on, so that you don't want to tune out. Uh, and that's what, if a book can do that, then it can be a movie. And if a book isn't doing that, but has potential, because it has a strong protagonist and a strong antagonist, that's where a treatment comes in. Uh, you write a treatment and, and fix all the problems with the book in the treatment and pitch the treatment. I've sold a number of movies based on a treatment because the book had problems and uh, I almost wouldn't let the buyers read the book because once they said they want to do it, I go, okay, let's just go with the treatment, please. <laughs> but at the end, if you know they're ready to sign, they have to look at the book and then they'll say, I see what you mean, uh, but the treatment solves the problems. You know, if the middle's not dramatic enough. Most especially a problem that happens with novels is that the ending is not powerful enough and clear enough. The third act is not clear enough in many novels where you don't see that there's a turning point that goes from act two to act three because uh, the editors in New York are not as demanding as audiences are in a movie theater. They don't really look for turning points the same way an audience does. And, uh, and there are exceptions to all, you know, all this stuff. It's none of it is rules. But basically, a three-act structure needs to be there and it has to be dramatic. All three acts have to be dramatic and you have to have a protagonist that you can relate to. You don't have to like her, or, but you have to relate to her. And you have to have an antagonist who is worthy of her and is in every way as strong as she is because otherwise the ending is predictable and uh, the stronger the antagonist, the stronger the, the protagonist and the stronger the story is. So um, I hope that answers the question, but, but books that have at least some of those elements can be turned into movies. We actually, I used to have a, cl a class that is called uh, Designing Your Novel to Be a Film because the best place for that to happen is on your original drawing board. Make sure that when you design your novel that you include these, these things in the novel. And that way you won't be disappointed when nobody wants to make it into a film. Why does a book fail to become a movie? If somebody wants to adapt a book and they think they buy the rights, whatever it is, and just somehow doesn't translate, doesn't work out. Well, there are hundreds of reasons why that can happen. But, but they come back in, in categories that, that you get used to. Uh, every book that's submitted to Hollywood is what's called covered. And uh, in my various webinars, I talk about coverage. And uh, coverage is an industry term for a, a story report where a reader in the story department of a agency or of a production company or a studio or um, any, any part of the business where stories go to be covered. And they're covered because the executives who make the decisions can't possibly read all the stories that come in. Too many things are submitted. Too many stories are submitted. And in, in the coverage, it covers every single part of the story, from a one-line pitch of the story to the genre of the story, the category, the length of the story, the quality of the writing, the dialogue, the characters, supporting characters, you know, main characters, supporting characters, plot, etc. So you get a full report in four or five pages that analyzes the story and, and, the, and, and it ends with a recommendation. Pass, consider with development, you know, uh, or uh, accept with development or just accept. 
and, and accepts are extremely rare. I mean, probably one to two percent uh, are in that category. And the reason that most books are turned down, I've already mentioned some of them, but has to do with uh, not clear who the protagonist is, not strong enough antagonist, too many characters, uh, can't figure out what's important, what's not important, uh, too much repetition, the dialogue, the characters don't sound different from each other, they all sound the same. And we all know from literary, you know, literature graduate school that one of the common questions that you asked is, you're just given lines of dialogue from plays and asked to identify the character by one line of dialogue. Because the great playwrights make their dialogue characteristic to each character. And Lady Macbeth would not be sounding like Juliet. You know, there there always be clear who's talking, and and that's another reason for frequent turndowns. The audience isn't big enough. You know, a story about Latvian Americans take in a, in a small neighborhood in Detroit. You know, may get made as an indie movie, if if you know somebody like Meryl Streep wants to be in it because she's Latvian. You know, but other than that, the chances are that Fox is not going to develop it because they're looking at audience appeal, you know, they're looking at demographics. So any of those reasons and all of those reasons are, are, are reasons why a book gets turned down. Uh, sometimes a book is too internal and screenwriters struggle with it, but they can't figure out how to externalize the constant thinking and philosophizing of a character. There are examples of books that have done that well uh, like the world according to Garth, you know, is an example. But they're usually internal stories are very hard to turn into films. Uh, and in, when, what happens is halfway through the attempt to do that, you realize you're inventing all the dialogue, and then how much, that, and therefore how true is this movie to the book at all? You know, is it even the same book? Because if the book did everything internally and you're inventing all the dialogue. You know what I mean? It's, it, it, so there are a lot of reasons, but they all have to do with, um, with drama. Drama is about scenes, and the scene is, which is, is a place and time in which there is conflict. Two forces come together in conflict, and the conflict is resolved. Uh, and that scene is the unit of drama. And if the scenes in a book are not clear enough, Scenes are very distinguished in books. I mean, in Vonnegut, for example, his scenes can be two sentences long. In, uh, you know, in, in Faulkner, his scenes can be 20 pages long. And, and, but, but still, there'll be clear scenes. My favorite example, of, I think the shortest story in, the, in American literature is, uh, goes like this. Have you lived next door to a man who's trying to play, to learning to play the viola? That's what she asked the police when she handed them the empty revolver. It, it's, a, it's a short story by uh, <clears throat> Richard Browdigan. And, uh, but there's a whole scene, right? A whole story, a whole scene told in a couple of lines and just as tour de force to show that you don't need a lot of words to make a scene. Uh, we get it right away. And, and that's, drama is a scene like that. And there are two kinds, two components of drama as I talk about in my various books, I mean, one of them is action. She hands them the empty revolver. And the other is dialogue. Have you tried living next door to a person learning to play the viola? You know, that, those are the two components of action and drama, dialogue and action. And dialogue like, good morning, how are you doing today, is not dramatic. And yet, many novels are filled with it, uh, with that kind of dialogue. So the great novelists that have been made into great movies have vital dialogue that is really action dialogue. Like it's a line from Hemingway that I love to quote in creative writing classes, these two people sitting near a train station and at one point she says to him, would you please, 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 please stop talking. And that's a great example of a piece of dialogue that is pure action you know that there is no hope for their relationship after she says that. 
And, and, and it goes on to say, the man did not say anything for a moment. Then he asked, would you like a beer? <laughs> and, and we know, you know, it's all over between them. But there's an example of how great dialogue is. You know, like from <clears throat> Chinatown, your, your, my mother, my sister, my mother, my sister, my mother, my sister, remember that? He said, tell the truth. And she keeps saying the same thing over and over again until he finally realizes that she's telling the truth. And that's when you have, you, you know that the writer knows what he's doing. And that's why, that's why screenplay writing is so much more difficult than novelists because there are the harshest rules in writing screenplays. And, and the harsh rule really is only one harsh rule. Every single word in the screenplay is connected to every other word. And in a novel, that's just not true. I mean, you can't, you know, in a 600 page novel, that just can't be true and it isn't true. But it is true in the screenplay because if you say a word and the audience, you know, leaves the theater and they loved it otherwise, you know at the bar they're gonna say, but why did he say that one thing to him? Like it made no sense. You know, take care of yourself. Why did he say that at the end of that scene? And they won't let go of that until they figure it out. And if they can't figure it out, then they go, there's something wrong with that story, you know? Because it's all, you know, like you can't focus a camera on a red hat in a movie without making that pay off later. And, and that's just not true of novels. For one thing, novels kind of float in, in the air of the reader. You know, as you read the book, you paint pictures in your head and movies are much more demanding than that because they have to make decisions. Like, what does she look like? Uh, and you, you have to cast her with the right color hair. And, and, you know, one of the most famous lines in history is from the Iliad when everyone knows the Helen of Troy is supposed to be the most beautiful woman who ever lived, right? But Homer is not going to deal with that because that's just impossible. So what happens is <laughs> it says when she appeared, he says the elders of Troy were standing on the walls of Troy, chattering like locusts with each other until Helen, till, till a hush fell among them as Helen appeared. And one of them says, terrible indeed is her likeness to that of an immortal goddess. And that is the entire description of Helen of Troy, which, you know, can't be beat because it leaves it completely to your imagination what she looked like. And he wasn't about to say she was, you know, five foot two, red hair, blue eyes, et cetera, which immediately will kill her beauty in some people's minds. And, and so it's, that's why drama is so much more challenging. It's the ultimate expression of storytelling and it's why movies are, you know, hugely powerful instruments around the world. Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sorry. Was All the President's Men an adaptation from Woodward and yeah. Bernstein's book? Okay. Yeah. So the dialogue in that and the, and, and the, the, the running, I, I just remember in so many scenes they were running and, and can you talk about that script in any way? Just you know, I, I'm not as familiar with the okay. story as, I, I mean, with the script as I'd like to be because I mean, I'd like to have recently read the book and sure, the script, sure. but one of the things that you do in a story like that is that you, you add the running because there probably isn't a lot of running in real life. Right. I mean, these journalists are probably too heavy to be running. And, and <laughs> they don't look like Robert Redford probably either. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> some of them might, but they're not, you know. But, but I think that that's what the big challenge, like Spotlight is, is an example. Excellent, they, yeah. they took a lot of, lot of reporting from Boston Globe and, and turned it into a dramatic movie that covered, you know, collapsed many years into a few years. Uh, you, you have to take those liberties, and that's why you end up saying inspired by a true story instead of based on a true story, etc. Uh, I've been through that many times, but adding action, adding drama is what you have to do. Right, in the scene in Spotlight where Stanley Tucci, you don't see him yet, you just hear him yelling at his assistant, and so I think something's thrown, and then the look on Mark Ruffalo's face, and, and that right there is enough to to right. kind of set the stakes. You know, exactly, it's great. and it's, exa it's, it's good drama because it involves the audience immediately because you don't see what's happening. So you see a reaction to what's happening, so you have to figure out what's happening. And one of the common mistakes that you know, younger writers make is that they patronize the audience by explaining too much. 
by thinking that every single thing has to be, you know, there. And when I always say that when you're editing, like the top 10 rules of editing are all the same. Cut, 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 cut. Because when you're in doubt about whether you need something, that alone is a reason for cutting it. Just cut it. You don't need it. The audience will make the jump and will fill in the blanks. And if you don't let them fill in the blanks, it's called painting by the numbers, then you, you come across as patronizing to the audience and they, they get bored. They don't want to hear every detail. You don't have to say your honor in a court scene every, every single sentence. Uh, you don't have to say the character's name every time you talk to the character. I mean, these are, people get, get that out of their system after 10 years of writing, but at the beginning, you don't know where the lines are. And the sense of the audience, I mean, one of the things I like to talk about is the psychology of the audience. Like, it's not the psychology of the author that makes you read a book. You don't care about that. You know, it's just like you're listening to your friend talk about his uh, latest ballot in the hospital. I mean, how much do you care about how he felt about every day? You know, you, you pretend you care as long as you can, but if he has any sense at all, he'll keep it, keep it you know, cut it down, right? And the truth is, you don't care about the psychology of the characters either. That's not what's important. What's important is your psychology, as always, the audience's psychology. And that's why Hitchcock and Peter Weir really know what they're doing. That, that drive away in Witness is one of the most brilliant parts of the film because of the length of the driveway. So it was a location choice. He's telling the location manager, I need a place that has a long, long, long driveway that will give me a 60 second tracking shot you know and in the birds when the heroine takes this flashlight without even testing whether it works or not and starts heading up the the wooden steps because she hears rustling in the attic you know that is the longest walk up the steps you've ever seen a film because it is so stupid that the audience needs at least three or four steps to get it out of their system saying oh come on why is it every actress, and why does she have to have white underwear on? Why is it always at the end of a horror film? And why doesn't she test that, you know? So once you get past that, okay, now she's on the middle step. And then you go through like, oh my God, why is she, you know, this doesn't make any sense. I, I can't stand this. I don't want to watch this. And then a few more steps. And by the time she gets to the top step, you're ready. Like, okay, I paid to get scared. This is it. And, and that is using the psychology of the audience. That's the timing that the audience needs to get into the exact right mood. You know, it's just like the speech in Julius Caesar where Mark Anthony comes up after Brutus's brilliant speech on the you know, corpse of, of Caesar, and Anthony comes up and praises you know, Brutus's speech and calls him the Honorable Brutus. And uh, by the end of his speech, he's turned the entire crowd against Brutus even though they were all cheering for Brutus at the beginning of his speech, he takes the psychology of the audience and twists it around in a way that, you know, you can see it coming, but you don't care. You just want to go there with him. Uh, and, and it's not about Anthony's, nobody cares about Anthony's psychology, you know, and nobody cares about Brutus's psychology there. That's not important. And nobody cares about Shakespeare's psychology because nobody knows what his psychology is. They said, you know, the greatness of Homer and Shakespeare, that they themselves were nowhere to be found in their work. Their characters were everywhere. And the characters speak directly to the audience. You know, and that, that's the hardest thing about writing, is figuring that out. What are the biggest mistakes you see new screenwriters make in their first screenplay? Uh, for, you mean literarily or? Structurally, dialogue, character. Um, because the biggest mistakes they make is usually their personalities, but but uh, <laughs> of, the, of the actual writer or yeah oh, okay. But but, but that aside, um, I think the biggest mistake is is over explaining and uh, not knowing how to tunnel uh, the background of the story into the story instead of laying it out. Like we just developed a brilliant screenplay for the last several years in which the opening conversation just is not convincing because there is no other uh, explanation for the, the words in the conversation other than explaining to the audience what's going on. 
And, and that's a hard to avoid mistake because you know you've got to explain what's going on. But if you do it overtly, the audience is going to not believe the, the dialogue. They're not going to believe, you know, they're going to not be able to suspend their disbelief. So you have to sneak these things in to the story at, at times when they're needed and not too much too soon. One of the common mistakes, I think the, the, the root mistake beneath that mistake is thinking that the audience is not as smart as they are. It's, it, it's looking down on your audience. Because respecting the audience is essential to good storytelling. You have to believe in the audience. And you know, imagine sitting on this country porch and telling a story with no audience, right? I find that very hard to imagine because storytelling is about audiences. You, you can Im immediately start telling the story if even one person shows up. But sitting there and telling it by yourself, that isn't what a story is, right? So if one person shows up and it's Jackie, you're gonna tell it differently than if Sally showed up first. And if Sally and Jackie are there together, you're gonna to tell it differently than you would have to either one of them by themselves. That's just the nature of human communication. So not respecting the audience or not realizing that it's all about the audience is probably the biggest mistake. And it, and it takes a while to get out of that mistake because the only way to get out of it is through constant feedback that tells you it's not necessary because somebody told me once, like an editor is the person who tells a writer when to stop writing. And I thought that was actually a lot of truth to that because how's a writer gonna know unless somebody says you don't need that? Uh, and, and I think that that is often the case with first screenwriters is they, they put a lot of things in they don't need. Uh, we need much less than, than you think we do. We don't need a scene to come to an, you know, to come to an end. It's okay to cut out of it. I mean, writers are constantly have a great line at the end of a scene, but then they add a couple of more lines, They're insecurity lines, they call them. So we instantly just cross them out because they already had a great line. That's the end of the scene. And yes, everything hasn't been quite wrapped up, but it, that's, that adds energy. When you cut that, you're pouring energy into the story. When you leave it there, you're sucking energy out of the story because the audience is like bored through those last two lines and going, oh, why did we need that? I was, I'm out of it at, you know, you had me at a low kind of, you know? And, and I think that's probably the most common mistake is overwriting, just overwriting. You said earlier personality? Just, well, <laughs> screenwriters have to be careful with their personalities because by nature they're very um, overtly at least self-confident you know, aggressive people. Uh, mostly that's a, a mask for lack of self-confidence, which is a normal thing for a writer to have. Uh, we all have that, no matter what stage you reach, you'll always have the lack of self-confidence, but then the world's divided into those who do it anyway, and those who let that stop them from doing it. You know, every actor has that before he goes on stage. Um, some of the greatest actors, Richard Chamberlain, used to throw up before he went on stage. And, and, but he went on stage. I mean, it was just part of what he did. You know, you get nervous before you start, and that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. You know, if you weren't nervous, then you're not doing something important. So, you know, if you're going into battle on the battlefield, are you, should you be afraid? Yes. If you weren't afraid, you'd be, you'd be nuts. So, uh, I, I think that that's, what happens in personality is that sometimes people are, compensate in an over aggressive way and it's an automatic turnoff because one of the several things about succeeding in Hollywood is don't get on everyone's life is too short list. <laughs> yeah, I mean and it's really true. I mean that it's sometimes you get on it immediately and you'll never get off of it. It's very hard to break it. And and you have to you know realize that you you need to act with the people in the business the way you would act with true friends and uh, who will tell you you're an asshole if you're being an asshole. And but Hollywood won't. They'll just say, thank you so much for coming. We'll, <laughs> we'll be in touch with you and you know, that'll be the end of it. But they'll go, asshole, you know, as soon as he's out of the room. And demanding, it's part of demanding because there's a kind of petulance that sets in 
the longer a writer has worked without, you know, reward and, and acclamation and compensation. And it, it's almost like, I deserve this, you're going to give it to me now. You know, I, I had an actress at dinner one night and in the middle of dinner she said, you know, a lot of other people, she, she said, I demand attention now. And it was really funny because the men thought that was cute and the women did not. <laughs> they did not. My, she was not reinvited. Oh, no. No, the women definitely did not like that petulance because, you know, men thought it was sure, sure. cute because she was sexy and so on. But in today's world, uh, petu especially Hollywood, where the stakes are so high, everybody wants to get in. You know, thousands of people are lined up for every single position you could ask for. And uh, they want people who are cool and professional, not hot-headed and demanding. And when I see a writer is of the latter category, I, I just kind of run for the hills. And, I, and, and when I see a writer is not that way, when he's modest and so on, I will continue talking to him for years, even before I represent him or work with him, until I find something that you know I can work with, because he's so respectful and so, you know, not on my too short list. You know, he's that. That's a very rare thing, but it's it's important when you think about it. In any walk of life, you know, you're not gonna <clears throat> the the uncle who you can't stand to see at Thanksgiving is not the one that you want to be representing or making a movie with. No. Is that when, oh sorry to interrupt, is that when someone's too self-aggrandizing, like it's just this is the greatest thing and they they won't take no for an answer and it just yeah. becomes, Yeah, I mean that, that's part of it because you don't tell us how great it is, just tell us the story. Get out of the way, you know, of the story. We don't want to hear about, we don't want to hear this is your first pitch, we don't want to hear, you know, you haven't done this much, we don't want to hear that you practice this and that you know exactly what to say. We, do, we want to see if you've got the goods, and that is the story. Like Mark Twain said, don't tell us the fat lady is going to sing. Bring her out and let her sing. You know, that, that's, that's what we want to see. In, in other words, don't draw attention to yourself because that is not what we're interested in. We're interested in the story. And maybe we'll get to interest in you later like after you brought a couple of good stories in, then we go, by the way, you know, where are you from? And, you know, what's your story? But we don't want to deal with that at the beginning. Because the truth is, no matter who you are, if your story is good, we love you. You know, we love, because you told this story. And that's, that's a great, you know, kind of equalizer when you think about it. It's a, a real world of ideas. But if you start telling us about yourself and give us a chance to hate you, uh, before you even started telling the story, that, how stupid is that? And I have to say that years ago, I, I rarely, I stopped taking writers to pitches of their stories because they, most of the time, unsold the story after they sold it. Oh, no. For a very simple reason. They weren't looking at the buyer. They were in a coma. They were telling the story and they weren't watching the buyer's eyes, which is all that matters in a pitch. Like, I can see immediately if you're bored. And I'm gonna, you know, if I'm anybody at all, I'll switch to another story to pitch you. You know, I, because there's, that's what the, the buyer is thinking, can I do, do I like this story? Can I do something with it? But sometimes he'll just hear one word, dragon, and that'll be it. Click, my eyes go like, well, let's see, I've got a 315 and then I've got a 330, like I, my brain is thinking about other things because I know I can't acquire a dragon story. So why am I wasting this person's time? Well, the person's not even listening and looking at you, so he goes on talking. And, and, but the other thing happens too, he's already said enough to sell you. You're totally, this is what you're looking for. I can see it in your eyes, but he keeps talking. So after a while now, the buyer is looking at him. Instead of listening to the story, he's looking at him going, why is this guy still talking? I love this, I wanna ask some questions. You know what I mean? So. That's an example of a writer forgetting about the most important part of his story, which is the audience. His audience, the reader, the audience is the most important part of the story. And when you forget it, they know. The reader knows that you've forgotten it. And then they're, they're tuned out. They close the book. Ken, of the many books that you've written, uh, you have one you co-wrote entitled Writing Treatments That Sell, and maybe you can 
hold it up so people yep. can see it. It's a cool cover there. And uh, first off, can we define what is a treatment? Well, <laughs> this is one of the things that Shalai and I looked into when we wrote this book because um, we kept getting asked that question by clients. You know, what is a treatment? We have to explain it over and over again. And it suddenly occurred to us, what is a treatment ourselves? I and mean, what is their definition? So we did a survey of about 30 execs in television and film and asked them that question. How would you define a treatment? And we asked them about 10 other questions and we really based the book on their answers. And basically the answer is that a treatment is a relatively brief written pitch of a story intended to be dramatized as a motion picture for film or television. And it's written in user-friendly, uh, grammar-free, quick language that is easy to follow. And it contains, highlights the most important characters and events, the obligatory scenes in the story. That's what a treatment is. Now, so how long is a treatment? Relatively brief. Uh, three pages to say 15 pages. Once it's past 15, 20, it's getting no longer relatively brief. And there was no industry agreement on it. And, and basically treatments range from five to 10 pages, good treatments. And we recommend that because of the attention span of the who you're dealing with, the audience, your reader, the buyer, uh, his attention span is limited and you do not want to extend it because he won't be there, she won't be there at the end of the story if you make it too long. So that's basically what a treatment is. And it's used for two purposes. It, it diagnoses the faults in a story. So you write a treatment of your story to see the faults in it. So it's a diagnostic tool. And then you fix them. And, and then it becomes a sales tool because it, so people are willing to read a treatment when they won't read a script because the script is a serious engagement, whereas treatment can be read relatively quickly. And those are, it's used in every part of the industry. And, and the, it's different from a synopsis because a synopsis is a, a dry, fully detailed uh, summary of a story. You'd find a synopsis in a coverage, for example. But the treatment is a pitch. It, it's the substitute for a live pitch. Like I'm doing a webinar called Pitch Perfect, which is about pitching uh, and when you get the rare occasion to do that. But now with the internet, we're, we're going to do a virtual pitching so that people can actually pitch to a producer and get an answer. Uh, and a pitch is extremely fortunate chance to sell your story. And again, you, you do not want to be prefacing it with anything. You don't want to reveal your personality. That's not what it's about. You want to just tell how strong your story is by showing the story. And uh, a treatment is the, the best you can do if you don't have the opportunity to pitch live. So the treatment replaces a pitch and is what most people use. And they use it through email and through uh, any other method they have to hand a piece of paper to someone else. Is there a chapter or two that you were surprised that people commented on? They had questions or even from Amazon reviews. Was there, is there a point in the book where people are, there's, it's just a, a topic of conversation more so than others? You know, I'd love to say that there is, but honestly, we, we gotten pretty strong response, positive response to the whole book. But I think the parts that, that cause people, that make people the most curious have to do with our analysis of a movie of the week. And the, when we first wrote the book, there were a lot of movies of the week in which we talked about the seven act structure of a television show. And the seven act structure, you know, there is a three act structure to stories. All stories have a three act structure. But in the Renaissance, for example, stories had five acts. And that's because they divided the horrible act two that everyone hates. I call it the Serengeti plane. Uh, because it's, you know, it's the hardest part of the writing. They divide it into three acts and now there's a five act story. And it's easier to write because each act has a beginning, middle and end. And each act can be subdivided into twists and turns and scenes. So television goes, goes even further and makes it seven acts. And that's because of commercials that have to come after each act, etc. So people were curious to see that. But when they saw that 
that the executives at the studios actually had a chart. Some of them actually took the chart into a pitch meeting and wrote down, um, jotted down what, you know, in the chart, what the writer, what the pitch was saying about what happens in each act and so on. So here's a filled out one based on a movie that we produced. And it shows one-liners of the scenes that occur in each act. And I think people realized that this was, um, they didn't realize how mechanical it was. And, and honestly, when I hear that, which I do often from writers when I'm, in the old days, at least when I was teaching at university extensions all over the country, uh, I realized that they didn't have the mentality to be writers. So let me give you a great example. A woman named Millie Meyer, God rest her soul, wonderful, wonderful lady, was a client for years, came up to me at a Riverside, UC Riverside workshop after, and she goes, I didn't want to say anything in front of the class because I didn't want people to make fun of me. But I took my favorite book, The Grapes of Wrath, and I outlined it. And is that stupid? And I said, no, you're the only craftsman in the class. <laughs> I mean, that's what a carpenter would do. If he wanted to make a table, he would take a table apart and see how it was put together. That's what a mechanic would do if he wanted to build an engine. He'd take an engine apart. So that's exactly what you do. And that, when, I, when they see this kind of breakdown, they understand you know, exactly how the mechanics of it work. And honestly, until you get to that point, you're really not ready to be a professional writer because if you thought that writing was a magic, you know, magic trick that you have to pull off every time or a miracle, which I guess most writers probably would think miracle rather than magic trick, then it's impossible, right? But it's not possible. I mean, and it's not impossible. It's possible to be a writer. People have been writers for centuries. They've been storytellers and, and storytellers tell stories in parts and they know what the parts are, and they do them in a way that makes sense. And uh, so the sooner you get down to the mechanics of how it works, the better. And that's what we try to do in our books is to show people the mechanics. I'm looking through for another, there's another page in here where we show what we call an intensity chart, where you kind of type one-liners of your whole story on a, on a single piece of paper. One-liners of all the important scenes in the story. Then you go, between the lines, and let's say you put hyphens, two hyphens for a non-dramatic scene or a scene with relatively little drama, and like five hyphens for a scene with much more drama, and 10 hyphens with maximum drama, right? So now you've got a page that has all these hyphens on it underneath the sentences, right? Then you draw a line across the hyphens, uh, connecting the hyphens. And then you turn it on its side. You turn the piece of paper on its side, and what you've got is a, something that looks like a roller coaster. and Because it, it, it shows you the ups and downs in your stories based on the drama, the intensity of the drama in your stories. And uh, that is a great diagnostic tool, because if you see that there's a whole slope that, in which the thing keeps going down, 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 and doesn't go up for a while, or it levels off, then you know you need to work on that part of your story. So that's what I call the mechanical approach. You know what I mean by mechanics? Like when you, when you want to outline a screenplay or a book, you just use three, three by five cards and you put on those three by five cards the obligatory scenes in the book. And you won't fill up a whole card because it'll just be a couple of words on each card. And what you understand when you start doing that is that creation of a literary work is what Aristotle called an imitation of reality. It's not reality. You're not re, you know, building the cider house and, and the world around the cider house. You're faking it. You're making the reader believe it's there. And, and you do that mechanically by, like I would if I were making the movie. I build a house front that looks like the cider house, right? But it wouldn't have a back because I'm only going to shoot the front of it. So that's what you're doing when you're writing. You're, you're just doing what's necessary to create the illusion that you're trying to create. And the audience believes that the illusion is real because it wants to believe that. And you've given them enough evidence to make them believe it. So you know when you're watching one of the old movies when they were just, nobody was dealing with production value the way we do now. 
You know, it just takes a little bit to make you believe in the story, even if the acting is bad, right? Even if the set is laughable, but you still are in the story if the story is good. You know, if, if the characters are good and the dialogue is good, and, and that's one of the things that we try to instill in writers is learn the mechanics of it because it's easier than, than you make it. You're not having to recreate a whole world. You're, you're, you need to do the right strokes to make the painting look like a person. And uh, that's what we try to do in you know, the treatment book. When Millie approached you after the course in Riverside and said, I'm so silly, I did this, you saw something in her that if the other writer said, well, I don't want to take the Grapes of Wrath and, and outline it, well, then they're kind of, they believe in this romance of being able to write and just sort of sit down and I'm going to take a bottle of scotch and a cigarette and pound away all the right. things that happen to me. They're, they're in great. love with the image of being a writer. You know, it's the romance of being a writer, the struggle, the torment, the agony and the ecstasy, all of those grandiose concepts that writers have done to get bigger pay, paydays. Uh, you know, that's all good. Like I had a writer who was a client for years, a dear friend, who like, we sold like 12 of his screenplays. And, and it took him, honestly, a week to write a screenplay. Wow. And uh, it took me three years to train him never, never to admit that. And, and so we're, I got him an agent and the agent was always beating him up and saying, you can't say that. You you have to you have to say you need three months, six months, or whatever. You can't say you do it in a week. They won't. You know, we're trying to get a million dollars for this. You know, and and that's the truth is you can do it in a week, but you can you know put it aside for two months and then go back and work on it some more and so on. But because the reality of writing is is much easier than uh, than the the myth of it, and. Uh, Walker Percy, one of my favorite novelists, <coughs> who wrote The Last Picture Show, said, uh, perhaps the, the, the secret of speaking is having something to say. And that's, that's what it's all about. You have a story to tell, then you can tell it. It's not a problem. Just don't start writing it until you know the story. Like, you don't start telling a joke before you know the joke, right? You don't walk in with three by five cards and tell a joke from a three by five card. Uh, you you know the thing by heart, and then you you tell it, and uh, it's not the agony. It doesn't need to be the agony. And, and when you, when you don't have a structure, that is when you haven't learned the mechanics of it, like the productive two kinds of productive writers. When you learn the mechanics, you can be happy, and you can do it whenever you want to do it. Like any writer who knows them will tell you, they can write on trains, buses, planes. They can write standing up, sitting down. I had a dear friend, Nancy Friedman, my client for years, who wrote on her back for the last 10 years of her life because she couldn't sit up and she couldn't stand up. Mm. And so she wrote it on her back and she just kept writing books. And you, you, the writing is easier if you know what you're doing. And you know whether it's Har Harlan Ellison or Ray Bradbury, they'll all tell you the same thing. But when you think it's this huge agony, and it is, like Virginia Woolf, you know, and so on, she's never figured it out. That's why. She, she's believed that it has to be an agony to, to be good. And I, I don't think Shakespeare was an agony. I think he was just dashing the stuff off as fast as he could write because he was reading everything that was coming from Italy and from, you know, south of Europe and uh, stealing it like crazy, redoing it, copying it. He heard stories all around, and he just couldn't wait, you know, before going to the pub and after going to the pub, to sit down and dash it off. And he revised. You know, he spent a lot of time revising. We know that from the folios. But uh, it's it's not the it's not the living in the garret, starving thing that has to happen at all. It's just figuring out what you're doing. It's a craft. You know, it's a craft that has to be learned. And the art comes in. There are brilliant people who do the craft, and there are not so brilliant people who can do the craft. So there's plenty of room for art, but um, it's not doesn't have to be cutting your ear off kind of thing. Can we go back for a moment for the uh, graph you were referring to, and just sure, see the intensity yeah. on the side, as you mentioned? Yeah, this this shows you what you know. This is what you're doing as you do it. You, you're writing little sort sentences, and you're putting hyphens and then you're drawing a line connecting them all. But then when you put it on the side, you can see the shape of your story. 
and you can see where it needs some attention. You know, where the, you know, there is all these peaks here, but no real valleys. So it would be much more dramatic if you dropped some of the intensity or you added less intense scenes in here so that the rises would be greater, et cetera. And, you know, it could be that everything is just fine when you do this and it looks really perfect, but most of the time you'll discover that it's not a roller coaster ride, which is what you want, you know, your reader to go on. You want them to to be screaming all the time, basically. And then toward the end, you see the highest peak and then it levels down. Yeah, it levels like, down, mm -hmm. although, you know, in today's storytelling world, maybe this is not the right way to end the story. Hmm. You know, it might be better to end on a higher peak. Oh, okay. You and that's Jaws? To, Sorry. No, no, this is, this is just a, a made-up story that we use as an example here. Yeah. So, but, but you should. That, I mean, that's just like my client, Millie Meyer, outlined The Grapes of Wrath. You sit, sit down with a movie like Jaws or like The Meg that's coming out in August uh, from Warner Brothers and, and, and chart it. And, and you'll see how conscious the story is uh, of these ups and downs. I mean, people, th they know what they're doing. Directors are known for their ability to do that. And if you want, you know, you want a crazy, all-out, screaming ride, uh, go see Lara Croft or one of the James Bond movies, and you'll, you'll see that that's, that's what they try to deliver to you. And if you want a more tempered ride where you can get deeper into the story because you have a moment to rest between peaks, then you'll see an, another kind of story. Sorry, I cut you off, but you were saying that today's peaks might end a little higher. Would that be because of there's a possibility of a sequel or...? Yeah, I mean, usually it's, it's that. And it's also because we are... To, ever since the moment that Star Wars hit the screens, I'll never forget that moment because when I watched that movie, I thought, this is a watershed in the history of movies. We will never look at movies the same way again because the scenes were the shortest scenes I've ever seen. You know, the scenes before that probably averaged two to three minutes. But when in Star Wars, the scenes seemed like they lasted six seconds or 10 seconds. And you could not see everything in the scene, which made you instantly fall in love with the movie because you believed in the world if it was so chock full of stuff you couldn't see at all. You just have to go see it again. And I thought, this is brilliant. And it was a foreshadowing of the attention span that we're now fully living with. We weren't quite there yet when it came out. It was a little ahead of its time, but it totally predicted the world we live in now where our attention span is just minute because we're being bombarded by so many pieces of information from so many directions. We're distracted all the time. And you know, the text is ringing, the phone is ringing, the, the email is ringing, you know, our, our head is ringing. Our eyes are buzzing from, you know, somebody said Americans look at 52,000 commercials every day in a normal day. And I think that's true. I mean, if, assuming you commute to work and you're looking at everything out there, uh, buses going by, you know, billboards, etc. So I think that um, there's another example of a filmmaker who understood the audience psychology and who directly addressed it, who directly addressed that that's what he's all about is grabbing your psychology and playing with it and you love it because nobody's done that to you before nobody's nobody was making movies that you had to immediately go see again because you wanted to see what that little gizmo was in the in the far corner that you didn't happen to focus on and now the scene's over and you're all to another scene and you miss that so you got to go back and train your eye to watch for that corner and you know how that is you you're always thinking next time i watch it i'm going to really watch this corner or some, this corner because I know I don't have a chance to see it all. And th that is really screwing with the psychology of the audience. I love that. Well, yet another book of yours is Sell Your Story to Hollywood, The Writer's Pocket Guide to the Business of Show Business. Um, I know there's lots of great nuggets in there. Something I saw from the Amazon page, there are four things in order that I'm about to read that'll guarantee success. I think, <laughs> and this is in the foreword or something. Perseverance and this is in this order, or determination or stamina, connection, be fun to work with, and lastly, talent. Really, that's the order? 
Yeah, that's definitely the order. I mean, <laughs> actually, I've, I've, in my mind, I've added a, another one before talent, which is luck. Oh, okay. Uh, luck is definitely important. But um, yeah, you can think about it. Some movies get made just because of perseverance. Somebody keeps persevering and they'll, they can get the movie made. And somebody can make a movie because they have connections. You know, Sofia Coppola, you know, she got to make a movie. She's got incredible connections and many other people in Hollywood. And uh, being fun to work with, that happens all the time. Movies get made because of that. But I've never really seen a movie get made just because of talent. So of all these things, uh, the three that I, that I started with, like perseverance, et cetera, being fun to work with, these are sufficient causes of movies. In other words, all you need is one of those and you're able to make a movie. But talent is not sufficient. You have to have talent plus one of those other things to make a movie. And there's plenty of talent around. Uh, the good news, I mean, that's, so that's the bad news. Talent is not enough to make a movie. Uh, but the good news is that if you have talent, it's what L everybody's looking for in Hollywood. They're looking for somebody who's truly talented because they don't want movies that are just made with perseverance or being fun to work with or having connections. They want truly good movies. So if you've got talent, that's great, but you need to get those other things. You need to persevere. It's not a, you know, a career for the faint-hearted. Uh, you know, if you say, I'm going to give myself five years and then I'm going to go back to my horse ranch in Utah, you'll be back there before you know it because life loves little deals like that and it always gets you back to the horse ranch. Uh, if you say that there'll be no limit on my career, I'm going to continue no matter what, um, then you've got a chance to do it. And maybe you'll get lucky along the way, but I always say build the tracks for success, don't build them based on luck. Uh, so yeah, that's l luck is an important part of it because sometimes you can have everything ready to go and somebody comes out with a similar movie and you can't do it. Going back to the school of thought of two types of people, unproductive, negative versus positive, what about unharnessed talent versus harnessed talent. And I'm making my own little genre here, but people that, there's, there's so much talent here, but there's a lot of people that don't harness it. And they spin their reels talking about these ideas. How does someone go into the harnessed category? Well, it, it, going into the harnessed category just means discipline to sit down and actually figure out time and use the time and just, you know, determine to do it. You have to de be determined. You have to persevere. Uh, there are a lot of people that have what I call artistic syndrome who would like to be creative, who say they're creative, who, shy, who s show some signs of creativity. But creativity is actually having finished a script, you know, having finished a novel, uh, and continuing to write another one while you're waiting for the reaction on the first one. Uh, creativity is like, I can't stop writing this. I keep getting stories and I keep can't wait to get to the next one. So you don't really wait at all when you send it out. You, you just, now I can do the next one. You keep writing. And, and that's somebody who's harnessing their talent. Unharnessed means when you've booby-trapped your talent by either not sitting down, being a fear of failure, or whatever your reasons are, procrastination. Uh, you know, Tony Robbins always says the best way to deal with procrastination Procrastination is to just postpone it. <laughs> there you go, yeah. You, know, you can do that later, but right now, get to work. So, harness talent is all a matter of discipline and determination. You know, starts with determination, turns it into discipline. Discipline turns into work. Work is based on time allotted to it. Um, as the ancient philosopher Hesiod said, if you put a little upon a little, soon it will become a lot. That's it. You do five pages a day. That's 60 pages, you know, after 12 days, right? So it's, it's just inevitable. It's the law of accumulating capital. And if people aren't doing that, then they're, they're completely unharnessed. And the only person who can really harness a writer is himself. So you can't, nobody can harness for you. You can get a manager to help you with that. You can get a disciplinarian to help you with it. But at the end of the day, there are more ways to evade discipline than there are to impose it. 
that's the, the genius of humanity, right? Lastly, you said something about being called back to the horse ranch, giving yourself five years. Someone just commented on our channel the other day, and they had a very valid point about give yourself three years. They were referring to acting. And I agreed with a lot of their, their statements, but they said they gave up this acting pursuit, and they should have done it sooner, and now they have a corporate job and things are much better for them. Should someone really put this like, I mean, my, my argument was, well, what if they know they're never going to be sort of this corporate type? I mean, it takes a certain type to sit behind a desk or attend meetings and pretend like you really want to be there. Some people aren't cut out for that. And what if you know that about yourself? Should you really give yourself this time limit? What if you know that you're not cut out for the corporate world? Yeah, their, their point was give yourself three years max to come to L.A. or whatever, become an actor. You could insert writing. That's, that's like saying, give yourself a year to go to Europe and get your wild oats out of your system before you settle down and get engaged or something. You know, if that's the way you're looking at it, then it will just be a three-year lark. You know, it, it's not a career commitment. You know, there, there's a great, great moment in a movie called Burlesque. I don't know if you saw that movie, but it's uh, Christina Aguilera is in it. And in one of the opening scenes in her little town, she goes to the bus station and she stands in front of the ticket window and she says, I, I, need, I want a ticket to L.A. And he looks at her and goes, one way or round trip. And she goes, you got to be fucking kidding me. <laughs> and and it's, it's, it's the line in the movie that defines career commitment. You know, she's not going to go to L.A. and come back. She's going to L.A., period. That's the end of the story. And that's why movies like that and La La Land, you know, put artists in tears because they're true, true examples of true stories about what artists go through when they make decisions to give up things. And, uh, you know, I, I, I used to give a class in, at UCLA called Keeping Your Spirits Up for Creative People. And one day I was going around the circle on the first day of class having people introduce themselves. They were mostly actors and actresses who signed up for it for obvious reasons. And uh, the first one, I said, please give us your name so we'll remember your name and where you're from. Or, you know, give us your name and where you're from and um, what is the, tell us what is the question that you hate to hear most, you know, at a party in L.A.? And so the first woman says, my name is Carol, and uh, I'm from Detroit. And the question I hate to hear the most is, when are you going to go back to Detroit and work for the post office? And I said, and how do you react to that? She goes, usually by bursting into tears and running out of the room. I go, oh, OK, so we're, we're going to work on that in this class. So I asked for the next class, next person, my name is Alice. I'm from Southern California. And uh, the question I hate to hear the most at parties is, what have you been in big lately that I've seen? <laughs> and I said, and how do you react to that? She goes, I say the Pacific Ocean. So there's an example of a harnessed person and an unharnessed person, right? The harnessed person knows that she's going to get stupid questions from stupid people, insensitive people who aren't really thinking and that there's nothing in the world that's going to stop that from happening. So she's going to protect herself by coming up with an answer beforehand so she doesn't have to run out of the room and cry. And the other person is unharnessed because she goes out of the room and cries. She's the one that believes this artistry thing is some magic, you know, miracle that has to happen. And she doesn't understand it's mechanical. You know, first thing you have to do is protect your biggest asset, which is your brain. And if you haven't figured out how to do that, then don't go out in public yet because people are not going to st start suddenly being sensitive the moment you appear in public. They've never shown any sign of it in the human history, right? Mm -hmm. I always love this uh, a book I read ago, years ago as a graduate student called It Began in Babel, A History of the World, you know, told with a sense of humor. And it, 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 the epitaph of the book at the beginning is... Uh, when you really think about it, people on the whole are extremely stupid. And it's a carving on the walls of Nineveh, 3200 BC. And you know, it's kind of comforting to read that because you go, well, nothing's changed. Right. You know, we're still there, we're still stupid, and you know, that's part of the human comedy. But 
don't be stupid if it's your, you know, your whole career at stake. You're the one who has to build the, you know, use the tools to build a defense around yourself so you can continue your career. And uh, people are not going to help you until they see that you've got that figured out. Then they'll help you. you know, it's just the way they are. That goes back to what you said about the sort of crackpot neighbor in the garage making these paintings and then everyone thinks they're crazy until they sell right. one for a million or two and then all of a sudden everyone wants to know them. So Yeah, and everybody, everyone thinks you're a genius and, and, and predicts and said, I always knew you would do well. Like my father told me I was an idiot when I became a professor, like he didn't understand how I was going to make a living because I didn't sign up for pre-med, I signed up for classics in college. And 19 years later, when I told him I was leaving being a professor for, you know, being a producer, he told me I was crazy that uh, how was I going to make a living? And then four weeks later, he was on the set of one of my movies and said, this is great. Keep doing this. You know, so you, if you put a lot of truck on what other people think, you, you'll be a mess all your life. And one of the things I really hate to see is someone who is all about just pleasing people and will say whatever they need to say to please the people in front of them. And then you, know, you realize they don't have a mind of their own. Uh, and that's, that's too bad, too bad to, to lose your life, to, to spend your life without a mind of your own. It's a terrible, a mind is a terrible thing to lose, as they say. And the writer is somebody, I think, who's exploited their mind to the, to the max and, and taken, you know, followed its lead into places that it would never have imagined they would go. And I think that's a heroic, you know, a heroic way of life. And the world needs more storytellers.